Good morning and welcome in again to The Net this morning. We're continuing on in our series, Leap Over a Wall. Uh, it's exploring David's spirituality, what his, as Eugene Peterson calls it, that earthy spirituality, what it might mean for us. Psalm 1829 is where the title of this series comes from that says, with God's help, I can charge into a battle. With God on my side, I can leap over a wall. So come what may in your life, we believe that with God on our side, nothing is impossible. With God on our side, we can have a God-sized imagination, even in the face of our giants, as we talked about last week. I really believe David, who's a hero of my faith and probably some of yours too, David's life has so much to teach us. So I'm looking forward to continuing this series. And today we're going to talk about David and Jonathan, David's best friend, one of David's closest companions that we read about in the Bible. David and Jonathan's relationship was the most unlikely of relationships, but we'll see how that might be important for us to learn from today. So I really do think this morning's uh, service or this morning's uh, passage is really important for us as we think about our own faith and how we connect with God and each other. Friendship is a huge part of that. And friendship is not typically something we think of has been godly necessarily. We don't think that's a huge, high, important thing for our faith with God, but it is. And I, and I think David's life shows us that. So right after the story of David and Goliath, which takes place in 1 Samuel 17, and I hope you read it some this week, there's a lot of good juice in there. There's a lot of good stuff in there. If uh, we, did, we didn't have a chance to get to all of it last week in the last week's sermon. So I do encourage you to go back and look at that. But this week we're looking at really 1 Samuel 18 through 20, which highlight David and Jonathan's relationship. But we're going to focus just on the first couple of verses from 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 5. This is right after David's beaten Goliath. It's uh, after this happens, Saul brings David in and he's kind of you know telling him, you're going to be part of my people now. You're part of my clan. You're in the inner circle, so to speak. And Jonathan gives his life in a way to David. We learn about what their relationship really looked like right from the get-go. So let's read today 1 Samuel 18 verses 1 through 5 from the Common English Bible. It says this, <clears throat> As soon as David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan's life became bound up with David's life, and Jonathan cared about David as much as he cared about himself. From that point forward, Saul kept David in his service and wouldn't allow him to return to his father's household. And Jonathan and David made a covenant together because Jonathan cared about David as much as he cared about himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his armor, as well as his sword, his bow, and his belt. David went out and was successful in every mission Saul sent him to do. So Saul placed him in charge of the soldiers, and this pleased all the troops as well as Saul's servants. Thanks be to God for this word. Would you go with me to God in prayer? Good and gracious God, we love you. We need you to be here today. We want to hear a word from you. So come and speak to us. Speak to us in a way that we might be able to hear you, to connect with you, to be changed by you, changed more into your love. Oh God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen and amen. I've shared about a lot in my time here, about my time in the mountains and my time at Brevard College, which is where I was first introduced to the mountains, really. It's nestled in Brevard outside Asheville. It's this beautiful mountainous place. Uh, my time there, we hiked a lot. We went around a lot of waterfalls. I played a lot of tennis in college as well. So hopefully you aren't tired of those stories yet because I've got one more for you as that's what this passage really made me think about. Brevard College is located in Transylvania County, which is called the land of waterfalls because there are literally hundreds of waterfalls tucked away in this county. You take one quick trip down my Facebook page and you'll see that my time in Brevard and in the mountains is littered with pictures of waterfalls that you'll see up on the screen right now. Lindsay and I visited many, many, many of them and took pictures uh, along the way. We saw big ones and little ones, saw them in the winter, summer, spring, and fall. They're everywhere and they are absolutely spectacular. On the tennis team, we had this tradition and I use the word tradition as more of an initiation, but we're going to call it a tradition for today's uh, purposes. But we have this tradition on the team where every single fall, uh, as we began a new year together, we'd get the whole entire team, just the players, not anybody else. Uh, we'd get the whole entire players and we'd go out to kind of this local waterfall that's less popular than other ones. 
and we jump off the waterfall. Now, a quick aside, I wanna make sure I make this note right now. I'm not saying this is a smart thing or it was the wisest thing for us to do. In retrospect, it's dangerous and foolish and not advisable. So now I've said that publicly, I can continue with the story. But every year we drive the 15 minute drive in our cars, the whole team loaded up together, boys and girls. And we find this favorite spot and we'd leap off a waterfall together. It was scary and reckless perhaps, but it was a blast. And it was this great way of connecting us right at the beginning of the new year. It didn't matter if you were a senior and you'd been on the team for four years, or if you were freshmen and still overwhelmed by the experience of college, it made us a unit. It made us a group of friends more than just a group of competitors. We were partners along the way of our season together, it really set the tone for what we wanted the team to be and look like. Now, I imagine some of you are thinking about your own bonding moments, perhaps from college or other places. We have these things that we do where we are become part of a group. It's this threshold, this rite of passage, I know our youth group calls it sometimes, where you and a group of people did something together. Maybe you tried a ropes course, or maybe you went to an escape room. Maybe you went out for a really long dinner to connect with these new people. Maybe you went to a show together or something like that. The pop possibilities are absolutely endless for how we can connect. But the point is that it formed us. It formed us together and it also formed who we are. That really is what this story is about today, that friendship forms us. That's what I want to talk about. How are our friendships? And I mean the deep, soul-nourishing, life-giving, love-producing friendships, those kind of friendships. How are they part of our faith? How are they important to our life with God? How does our friendship help us leap over a wall, as this series is looking at? Eugene Peterson, who is the author of the book, uh, Leap Over a Wall, this story of David's earthy spirituality, he writes about friendship like this. He says, friendship, friendship is a much underestimated aspect of spirituality. He says, it's every bit as significant as prayer and fasting. This is the part I really like. He says, friendship takes what's common in human experience and turns it into something holy. I love that line. Friendship takes what's common in human experience and turns it into something holy. I don't know about you, but I, I rarely think about my friendships as holy. I certainly don't do it often enough. I don't elevate the idea of being with and for people as a sacred privilege that it really is. I don't lean into enough how much being a friend and having a true friend, how that can bring us closer to God, not just for accountability that matters, but just the connecting, how important that is to our faith and our life with God. You know, David is noted for many things across the Bible. Like I shared before, he is a hero of Christian faith for so many people. He, he's noted for his praise. Think about all the Psalms that have David's name that are attributed to him, that he said this or sang this or prayed this at specific times in his life. He, he praised often and we see that. He's known for his battles. Think of last week with David and Goliath, right? But many more after that, we read just in verse five that he was successful in all of his missions. He was a trusted warrior. He was good at what he did. And he was noted for his love for God. He's singularly, as I've said multiple times in this series, he's singularly in the Bible described as a man after God's own heart. That's high praise for this man. He was a man of praise, a man of war. He was a man of love for God. And we think also of David's relationships. He had many of them. Many of them were complicated too, but one of the beautiful ones was with Jonathan. And if you're like me, you've heard about this before, this relationship with David and Jonathan, and we sort of quickly pass by it. We think of David as King David. That's the part that we like remembering when the story gets out to when it really matters. The King David part is what seems most important. We go from anointing, where we read earlier in the first week that he was anointed as the eighth son, right? To Goliath, because that's an important one, and we hear about it in children's stories. And then we go straight to King David. We forget this whole part in the middle where he's scrambling for his life. Saul's trying to kill him. Saul, enraged, you know, jealous of David having been anointed, jealous of what David's going to be for the kingdom of Israel, for sure. Saul is trying to kill him, and does. In these three chapters, 17, or excuse me, 18, 19, and 20, Saul tries to kill David six different times in the same room, throwing a spear at him, kind of trying to kill him. So there's this tense relationship, this, this tense part of David's life that, if you're like me, we just sort of skip right over. Along the way, though, David had people who he loved and who loved him deeply, who stayed with him, who believed in him, that were true friends to him. So let's pause at this place in David's life today and see 
what that might teach us about friendship and how we relate to God and each other. So right after David uh, defeated Goliath, we have this passage that I read from 1 Samuel 18. And in 1 Samuel 18, 1, we heard that Jonathan's life became bound up with David's life. And Jonathan cared about David as much as he cared about himself. Now, that's an important verse just on its own. We could leave it right there, and that could speak to us in significant ways. But as often does with Scripture, when you really dive into it, you see that there's even a whole nother layer of what's happening. That word that's translated in Hebrew as life, it can mean a lot of different things for us. You know, the word nefesh is what it is in the Hebrew. It can also mean, and this is from Strong's Bible Dictionary, it can mean the soul, the self. It can mean life. It can mean a creature, a person, appetite, mind, living, being, desire, emotion, and passion. It's the essence of who we are, this nefesh, that's what it's talking about. It's not just who this person is on the exterior, it's really what makes them them. It's what makes their essence, their, it says their appetite, their mind, their living being, their desires, their emotions, their passions, who they are is the nefesh, and that's what became locked up together. That's what David and Jonathan had locked up together. The, the point of saying all that is that this word isn't talking about life in the general way we might hear about it today. It's talking about their very beings, what matters most in them. Another translation that I like, it puts it, that verse this way. It says, the soul of Jonathan was knit together with the soul of David. The verse, what I'm trying to get across here is the verse wasn't saying that David and Jonathan became bros all of a sudden and could just hang out together. They were deep, heart-connected, soul-intertwined, all-in companions from that moment forward. Their very lives, essences, were knit together. This was a huge opening of oneself to another. It was a risk. You know, opening yourself up like that to somebody else, it's a vulnerable place to be. And Jonathan, if we look at it, Jonathan didn't have much to gain from being friends with David, right? At least not on the surface. Think about who Jonathan was. Remember, he's King Saul's son, right? And the fact that he's being lifted up so much in the story means that if he wasn't the first son of King Saul, he was definitely in the lineage of possibly going to take over as king, right? It was his rightful birthright to become the next king of Israel after Saul was there. But David had been, by God's choice, anointed by the prophet. And, and in spite of his lack of claim, David is next in line. So what did Jonathan have to gain by befriending and putting David's life and future before his? Jonathan should have hated David. He absolutely should not have been friends with him, even less there's no chance that their life should have been knit together, knowing the controversy and tension that should have been in their relationship. But these two men, and I think God working through them, they realize something in relationships that seems to be elusive for us today. They realize that friendship, friendship is not a zero-sum game. In relationships, and especially in light of the digital way our lives are played out today, many, if not most, relationships seem to have taken on this idea that for you to gain something, I have to give up something, right? It's a give and a take we hear so often. For you to succeed, comes at a cost for me. We have this idea that there's this one pie out there and for someone to take three quarters of it means that you only get one quarter of it. It makes perfect sense for us, right? There's only a little bit left for me. If you do well, that comes at a loss for me. Look around us if you don't believe me. Look at the way that our politics are played out or the entertainment industry or sports or most of how the world behaves. It's this idea that there's a limited number, a limited kind of pool of resources of love, of friendship, of recognition out there in the world. So we have to fight even our friends to get some of this for ourselves to make sure we're taking care of ourselves. You might be thinking, well, of course, I would never do that to a friend. I want my friend's best interests. I have my friend's best interests and desires in my mind whenever I think about them. But the word friend, that word friend, it's come a long way from its roots. And it's come a long way to how do we think about it today. The etymology of that word friend, it shows that the word came from Old Germanic as well as other places. But originally meant to love or someone who was a person that you love, your lover. It meant to have a preference for them or to have favor for them. Now, the word friend, it's ubiquitous these days because of the social media world that we live in as well. We think of friends as the people who will see what we post and share in our digital lives on the digital 
uh, in the digital world. And I'm not saying that social media is bad, but I am saying that social media has cheapened or confused our understanding and our leaning into this idea of friendship and what it really wants what it really could be, what God wants it to be for our lives. It's taken away from our understanding of having and being a friend. I think also it's lessened our ability to hear David's story, David's story with Jonathan, and to be encouraged and challenged by it. One way that we might interrupt this kind of misunderstanding of the word friend is to look at what other people have said about it. And one of my own personal saints is been John O'Donohue. He's uh, written this book called Beauty that just speaks to me. He's got a book of blessings that's just been really, really important. And one of my favorite books of his is called Anamkara, uh, which is Celtic for a soul friend. John O'Donohue writes in this book, Anamkara, real friendship or love, it's not manufactured or achieved by an act or a will or intention. Uh, let me read that again. Real friendship or love it's not manufactured or achieved by an act of will or intention. He says, friendship is always an act of recognition. Friendship is always an act of recognition. He goes on to say, in the kingdom of love, there is no competition. There is no possessiveness. There is no control. In the kingdom of love, there is no competition. You know, one of the reasons we like to jump off that waterfall every year is because it takes it took us past the barrier of competition. We were all athletes coming in and we had one goal in mind. We wanted to win. And tennis can be such an individual sport that, yeah, we want the whole entire team to win for sure. But it really mattered that we won. We wanted to win our matches with every time we stepped out onto the course. So there was this uh, competition amongst us, right? That's part of what athletics is. And even though it's an individual sport, there's only six singles players that go out there on a team of 10, 12 people, right? So there's only six of you that are going to be starting each week. So there's this competition to make sure I'm part of the best six because you want to play oftentimes as an athlete. So this competition, it can seep over into the team. We can misplace it instead of against our opponents, against our own teammates, when you start battling and begrudging each other for their successes. But when we jumped off the waterfall together... We seem to be uniting in something beyond ourselves. Sure, it was symbolic, and maybe I'm giving it too much weight, but when you leap off the edge of a slippery wall, a slippery rock in the middle of the forest into freezing cold water below, when you do that with a group of people, some of them are pretty much strangers at that point, you're giving yourself to them in a strange and a beautiful way. You're being formed by them and you're helping to form them too. You're showing them favor, the, where the word friendship comes from. You're committing to them in a strange and, I think, a holy way. Jonathan, he had little to gain and plenty to lose by giving himself to David the way he did. He could have been king. He could have ha helped Saul, his dad, have David killed. It would have been easy. He saved David's life. It would have been easy for that to go the other way. He stepped in multiple times, though, to save David. He could have decided that, yeah, David's a friend, sure, in the way that we think about friendship, but I'm not going to let David get in the way of my future, Jonathan could have said. But instead, he chose to knit himself together with David. He chose the way of love instead. He chose to love someone as much as he loved himself. He chose to tie his very being with David in an act of incredible humility, incredible care. John O'Donohue, he's helpful again. He says, love allows, uh, excuse me, he says, love allows understanding to dawn and understanding is precious. When you are understood, you are at home. Understanding nourishes belonging. When you really feel understood, you feel free to release yourself into the trust and shelter of the other person's soul. Mm. I highlighted some of those words from that John O'Donohue, John O'Donohue quote because I think he cuts right to the heart of what friendship is about for us in the story of 1 Samuel 18, Jonathan and David, and in the story of our lives too. He says that first and always, I think this is right, it starts with love. How else could Jonathan have wanted David in his life? He had a love that was deep in him. And it wasn't his own, I believe. He opened himself to the love of God in that moment. And out of that abundance, not competition or zero sum or anything limited, out of that abundance came his love for David, God's chosen next king, the person who would recreate history for the Israelites at that time. 
From that love came a, came a deep understanding for Jonathan of who David was, right? It wasn't just the surface level understanding of David anymore or the competition or someone my dad doesn't like, right? From that became a, a deep understanding of who David had been called to be, who he was. He couldn't have seen David as the next God elected and chosen king if it hadn't been for that love. He understood that God's plans and God's ways are so much bigger than the human eye can see. What should have looked like an enemy, the worst possible kind, the biggest threat to who he could be. Instead, Jonathan understood him as a companion, as a partner, as a friend, someone he wanted to be with, someone he wanted to act for, to love. Out of that understanding, so it moves from love to understanding to belonging. Out of that came a deep belonging. J David and Jonathan, they belong to each other in ways that can confound even the wisest scholar. Jonathan helps him escape, gives him provision and more, takes the very clothes off his back, his sword, everything, which was absolutely a symbol of Jonathan's love for him, but really had practical effects too, to protect and, and give David the best equipment and make him ready for what God had called him to do. There was an understanding that he needed friends and Jonathan could be one of those along the way. Jonathan gave him a safe place to be, to belong in a country that was quickly be being turned against him by King Saul, Jonathan allowed David a dwelling place in the most difficult moment of his life. In doing so, his friendship became a place that David found his home, his true self. I believe part of his belonging, too, was wrapped up in his relationship with Jonathan. And all of this, contrary to what we might hear today, all of this didn't make David want to take advantage of Jonathan's relationship, as the cynic might suppose. When we try to act with compassion and empathy, love and understanding, with vulnerability, we can be accused of being weak. Popular culture would tell you that Jonathan's actions, they didn't consolidate power like he could have. He didn't take advantage of the opportunity that was right in front of him to get rid of David and become the leader, become wealthier, become more powerful, become stronger. It would have guaranteed a longer, more prosperous life, at least on the surface for Jonathan. But what actually happens isn't that David takes advantage of Jonathan by Jonathan's quote-unquote weakness and loving. The opposite is what happens, we see. We see that a generation later, David is still committed to who Jonathan was and protecting his descendants, right? Not even Jonathan anymore. Jonathan's out of the picture, but King David later in his life won't let any harm or hurt come to Jonathan's kids because of that love, that bond, that connection, that belonging that they shared together. Because of love. What happens when we err on the side of love in our relationships? Understanding. When we err on the side of understanding each other and belonging to each other. It's that we find connection. That's the end part of that O'Donohue quote. We find connection with each other and to each other. We find deep, soul-nourishing, life-giving, pain-releasing, love-infusing connection. When we recognize the God in each other, the possibility of God's very image being revealed in our world, when we see that that's what's in front of us, when we look into the eyes of a friend or a stranger, then we can connect. We can truly connect and belong. We can connect. When we connect with one another, that's when lives are changed. When we truly have a deep and meaningful connection, not just making good eye contact, not just a handshake, which is gone right now anyways, true heart-to-heart -heart connection with each other. And that's when lives really start changing. Not just other people who need their lives to be changed as we might look at it, but our lives are changed too. When we seek to love, to try to understand, to offer space, to belong, we find that our relationships form us in ways that are beyond our knowing. We find that in jumping off a waterfall with a stranger, we unite in something deeper and farther reaching and more meaningful than a competitive or restricted understanding of the word friend. We find that they are on our team. They are our partners. They are our beloved. This team of humanity that craves a place to belong to each other, a place to connect with another. So how do we do this? How do we live into this? 
How do we offer ourselves to each other and really be able to receive someone offering that to us? Where is the closest waterfall, you might be wondering? O'Donohue and Peterson, who I've used a lot for today, they're in agreement with how we do this. They both write about friendship and they say it's not an act of intention, although I do think we should be intentional about it. They say that friendship, the friendship David and Jonathan had, is started not with intention, but with recognition. It seems like a small point, but it's a really important one. It didn't start with intention that I'm going to go be friends with David or I'm going to go be friends with Jonathan. Instead, it started with the deep recognition of who they are. Martin Buber, who is a great Jewish theologian, he once said, meeting another, it's great, but not the greatest thing. The greatest thing any person can do, he says, is to confirm the deepest thing in them. That's a great line. The greatest thing any person can do is to confirm the deepest thing in another, to take time and have the discernment to see what's most deeply there, most fully that person, and then can confirm it in them by recognizing it and encouraging it. There are many parts of us that are deep. There are many parts of who we are that are complicated and wonderful and lovely and are often pushed down so deep. But one of the core principles I try to come back to whenever I'm interacting with someone and I'm not viewing them as a friend as I should have perhaps, I'm not seeing the best in them, I don't have this idyllic understanding of friend, what I always try to go back to is Genesis 1 verse 27. You've heard me say it many, many times. That verse in the first chapter of the Bible tells us that all of us have been created in God's own image. Let that sink in for a second because whether that's the thousandth time or the first time you've heard that, that's a powerful statement that every human being has been created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. That's a huge thing to say. We are all reflection, reflections of God's own self in the world. How we do that, each one of us is part of what makes this world so wonderful and unique and different and diverse because we all reflect God's image into the world in different ways that are precious and needed. So when we see what's deepest, most essential in the other per person, Really what we're striving to do, what we're hoping to do, and what we do by the grace of God is see the God image being reflected in them and through them. And we can only do that from a place of love. We can't do that through competition or hate or envy or anything else. It only and always comes from God's love in all of us. So try it this week. It's as simple as that. Try it. Maybe you're looking for someone to really be a friend in that deepest and truest sense of the word. So try something like signing up for prayer partners. The deadline's already ended, but Olivia Tobin, our director of youth ministries here at Providence, has given us permission to open it just for today. Maybe even right now. Email Olivia Tobin, O Tobin, T-O-B-I-N, at ProvidenceUMC.org. And tell her you want to be part of Prayer Partners, which is this amazingly simple and beautiful idea that we're just going to create these relationships 1v1 where we pray for each other, where we share about our life, where we look to see and recognize and them God's own image being reflected in their own particular and beautiful way into the world. That stranger might be the person you're jumping off the metaphorical waterfall with and diving into something deeper and more holy that'll connect both of you to the world and more importantly, to God's self in our world, to each other. Pick up your phone and, and email her. Let her know today that you wanna be part of that. Try waking up each day, if that's not your thing, prayer partners, or maybe it is, add this to wake up each day and maybe you need to write it on your mirror or print it on a piece of paper or put it in your journal, or put it wherever you can and, and pray this prayer. God, help me see you and others today. Help others see you and me. God, help me see you and others today. Help others see you and me. And see how that might change your relationship. See how that might change someone else's life just by recognizing that they are God's own image being reflected into the world. Try being bold and vulnerable, really sharing with someone who wants to see what's deepest in you. Try connecting and being with being a friend in ways that are beyond the simple click of a 
button on your phone or computer. Let's commit ourselves to starting from a place of love and watch how that helps us understand, belong, and connect to each other. Friendship has the power to form us, to form our worlds. And when we decide, when we commit deep within ourselves that our friendships are going to be based first and foremost on the abundance of God's kingdom, we find that those around us are transformed into their truest, most authentic selves, and we are too. We find that when we tie ourselves to another, when we bind our very being to the other, God gives us the strength and hope and love that's needed to leap over any wall that stands in our way. We do it together. We do it by recognizing who each other are, who you are, who I am, made in the image of God, precious and loved just as we are. So I encourage you to lean into friendship because they form you. Lean into friendship that doesn't look like trying to make them who you think they should be or what you think they should do, but instead recognizes what's most deep in them, what's most fundamental about them, who they are and who they are becoming. It's a process that continues to unfold over time. How they are acting in the world today might look different tomorrow. And thanks be to God for that. And thanks be to God that they have a friend like you who's willing to recognize how God is molding them and shaping them always. And in doing so, we are molded, we are shaped. Friendship forms and it changes lives. Thanks be to God. Amen.